Greetings, greetings, everyone. This is Refuge Temple NC Bible Institute. And we are a local ministry of Refuge Temple Church in Burlington, North Carolina. And I am so delighted to be with you this afternoon. We are broadcasting live uh, Saturday School at the Institute, which is a weekly post in which we share some educational content um, concerning a broad biblical topic um, that we hope to educate believers more fully on. So this week, we are going to continue in a series which we started about four weeks ago, titled Miracles of Jesus Christ. Um, within this series, we are going to look at 15 particular miracles which Jesus wrought in his ministry here on the earth. So let us get started with a word of prayer and then we will go into the lesson. I hope you are blessed and um, that you enjoy this educational content. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we just thank you for another opportunity, another opportunity to look into your word and to gain insight and to gain instruction. Oh God, today bless our ears and enable us to receive what you desire for us to receive. Bless everyone who will hear, everyone who will participate and be engaged in this lesson today. And those who would hear this at, at thereafter, oh God, we just ask your wonderful blessings upon us. Bless the Bible Institute at large that we may continue the work which you have started back in 2003. Oh God, bless every Bible student, every believer of the scriptures, oh God, that they may continue on the right path and believe the word of God as it is written. Oh God, we ask your blessings upon us all. In this we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless. Let me go to screen share so we can look at the lesson. I like to share via PowerPoint. I think it helps the students to follow what we are teaching. It also gives a visual of the concepts and the thoughts that we are trying to convey to everybody. So let us get into the lesson. As already stated, this is one of the miracles of Jesus, um, the miracle at Cana, um, water being turned into wine. This is a very well-known miracle. I doubt there are many in the Western world who are not at least aware of this miracle. However, as with most things in the scripture, um, we don't necessarily look at the details as we ought to. And I will tell you that one of my mantras is that um, if you're going to be a good Bible student, you need to become a detective of the Word of God. You need to look past the surface. You need to look at every word, everything that is there, and just as importantly, the things that aren't there. Because the Holy Spirit moved through those who wrote down the things that we see in our Holy Bible. And it is the Spirit of God who chose what to put in there, and he also chose what not to put in there. So we need to consider sometimes why certain details were not given to us, as well as those that are. Um, so hopefully today you will know more about this miracle. Hopefully today you will consider the implications of the miracle because there is a great importance in us understanding not only the power of God through the working of signs and miracles, but also the spiritual knowledge on which he desired for those who witnessed his miracles um, to get. Amen. And oftentimes that's what we miss when we look at the miracles of Jesus Christ or even the miracles of the apostles. And that is we miss that. So we need to 
hopefully gain a better understanding of why the miracle is important and why Jesus wrought the miracle. And last, we need to understand why the Holy Spirit moved upon the writers to write about this particular thing. And that's what we're going to do today as we talk about the miracle at Canaan. So hopefully there are no more technical difficulties and we can get through this unscathed. I hope to have this done in about 15 to 20 minutes. So please pray with me in Jesus name. Before we get into the specific lesson, I want to recap what we're going to talk about this entire season of Saturday School. The topic of season four, which we are in now, is the miracles of Jesus. Um, the four gospels will be our source, and they record roughly 40 miracles that Jesus performed. We will cover 15 of those miracles, and each episode will provide a comprehensive lesson about each one. Follow us on the Refuge Temple NC Bible Institute page on Facebook and set your notifications to favorites to receive notifications of the video posts that we send out. These are the 16 lessons that are in this series this season. We are in the fourth, um, the water into wine as shown here on the slide. This miracle, which we're going to talk about today, falls into the category that we discussed in episode one of the provisional miracles, the provisional miracles of Jesus Christ. These are simply miracles in which he um, which there was some need that he met um, by working the miracle, either um, by supplying food or by supplying drink or life. Amen. So this is one of those provisional miracles. He provides some natural source um, to those who he is working the miracle on behalf of. So a lesson plan. Um, this week's lesson covers the third miracle in our list that we just showed. Um, this happens to be the first of the miracles that Jesus wrought. Amen. The backdrop is a wedding feast in which Jesus and his five of his disciples were invited. So the lesson plan is this. We will start by looking at what the text states in St. John chapter 2. Um, we will then provide some background to the account. Um, some of this is extra biblical, um, but we need to provide some context about this wedding. Um, we will go into some explanation um, of the text and draw some points. We will then tie the miracle to the greater revelation that it provides. And finally, we will wrap up this lesson and preview next week's lesson. We will go in that order. God is our helper. So the text is found in St. John chapter number two. And the verses that are shown here are verse one through 11. This is reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And the word of the Lord says as recorded, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone 
after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim and saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. This is the word of the Lord found in St. John chapter number two, according to the King James Version of the Bible. We count it holy and blessed and we sanctify it in our hearts and our spirits and we endeavor to apply it to our everyday walk. want to take some time to provide some background into what was going on in this scenario. I have some reasons for wanting to do that. One of them is that we often look at this scene from a European or Western point of view, but we need to be reminded that Israel is in the Middle East. It's in another part of the world, which is a lot different than Europe, um, different even than Africa. And we must recognize that and respect that if we are to look at this scripture with integrity. So I wanna take some time to look at the geographical background and then look at some cultural aspects of this wedding feast and then go further into the discussion. So this is a map I pulled from Google Maps and it is showing modern Israel, I'm thinking that this um, photo was taken within the last couple of years. And the, the, the current location of Cana is disputed, um, but most likely the site is located where you see the pen at, okay? this. The site is located about 16 miles north of Nazareth, okay? Cana is about 85 miles north, northwest of where Jesus was baptized. Um, Jesus was baptized at the River Jordan somewhere down near the, the Dead Sea, okay? The Dead Sea is approximately minus 1,412 feet below sea level. Um, but Cana is about 216 feet above. So Jesus in his travels from, um, from the baptism back home was about 1600 feet. Um, that is quite an elevation change over an 80 mile peer, um, distance. Um, that's a pretty high grade for such a short distance. I'm bringing this up because we need to understand the terrain of the area and what happened and what preceded this wedding. Jesus and his disciples probably walked from this point all the way up to Cana with this 1600 foot elevation. Um, so you can imagine they were going uphill quite a bit of this journey. And most likely they took this path, um, which I show here, which is following the River Jordan, okay? So please keep that in mind um, as we look at this, okay? Some cultural aspects I want us to consider. Um, we First of all, we must refrain from viewing this wedding event in our traditions, uh, which for the most part are European, um, particularly Western European in nature. 
oftentimes when we think of this fe fe uh, feast, we think of it in our terms, but we must understand that this was a different period in time and it's in a different part of the world than what we are accustomed to. All right, weddings in this culture that we're speaking about today um, were community events. They stretched out sometimes for many days. Um, sometimes these feasts could go for a week and the bridegroom and the family, they would invite prominent members of the community. They would invite people in the families and they would just have a big old feast, amen, throughout the week. And oftentimes this would involve a whole village. Uh, so understand the context of the wedding um, in the Jewish society. Um, this was a big thing. This was a community event. Amen. And most of the time, a steward was assigned um, to the wedding festival um, in order to coordinate the events and make sure that provisions were provided for the guests. Um, the host of the feast um, would provide food and wine for the guests without rations or without limitations. Um, it was, and it still is in this part of the world, an extremely humiliating circumstance if a host fails to provide for their guest. Um, this is the backdrop in which the miracle takes place. Let us now dig deeper into the text. If you have any comments or thoughts on Facebook, please share them. Amen, in the name of the Lord. Okay, so John starts this account by stating that it occurred on the third day. Why is this important? Well, it's important because first we need to understand what he was referring to. Um, he didn't use these words loosely. Um, so the Bible reader, it behooves them to understand what the writer is referring to. As I stated earlier in the lesson, there are no wasted words in scripture. There is no wasted placement in scripture. It all is relevant, it's spirit and is life. So if John said the third day, there must be some significance behind the third day. So um, Jesus, I mean, rather John starts his account by stating that it occurred on the third day. To understand why John uses this timetable, uh, we must first look at the nature of John's gospel in general. We'll first note, in comparison to the three synoptic gospels, John's gospel is much more personal in nature. We see this um, through him referring to himself anonymously, um, and he does so in this account in which it is obvious that he is present, not only in this event, but in the other events that he talks about in his gospel. Um, he was very close to Jesus Christ as an individual. Amen. He starts this account um, of Jesus' life at the River Jordan um, with the events surrounding and including the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan. Just to give you some background, all the gospel writers had a certain point of view um, that they were trying to convey to the readers about Jesus's life. And the point of the gospels was not necessarily historic, but it was to show the full manifestation of the Son of God. Amen. And in John's case, John was portraying Jesus Christ as God manifest. He began his gospel not at the beginning of, um, not at the beginning when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but way back in the beginning um, when he says these words, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So John goes back to the deity of Jesus Christ, the godliness of Jesus Christ, and 
helps the writer to identify immediately that this is no other than the almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come to us in the, the nature of flesh, come to us as a man. Okay, so with that being said, John, a man, um, gives us an illustration of Jesus Christ, which is different than those of the other writers. Okay, so the starting point is the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan. And as I already illustrated, that location is at the Jordan, not too far north from the Dead Sea. Okay, this event, the baptism, marked the start of Jesus' public ministry as the prophesied Messiah, which the Old Testament prophets um, prophesied about and wrote about for many centuries. Glory to God. John was a disciple of Jesus Christ. We find this elsewhere and obviously was present for the events in which he records. Um, it appears um, the point of reference, day one, in John's timetable is the baptism of Jesus Christ. So we go to this day three. All right, I want to let us spend some time dealing with these days um, that John refers to in the first and second chapters of his gospel. So let's look at the days leading up to the miracle. Um, this will be found in St. John chapter one. All right, on the first day, John proclaims that he is not the Christ. This is John the Baptist. Um, Jesus comes to be baptized of John. And as most know, Jesus is baptized, says the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and a voice from heaven came saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this pronounces that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Okay, day two, um, Jesus, um, rather two of um, John the Baptist's disciples start to follow Jesus. And a number of disciples are chosen by Jesus within this second day, um, two of them being stated by name, which is Peter and Nathaniel. Nathaniel was a man who was actually from Canada. So on the second day, we see that Jesus has already arrived in the geographical area in which this wedding would take place. And on the third day, John picks it up in chapter number two, verse one, Jesus is present at the wedding. And we see that Mary is also present. As I've stated on a couple of occasions already, this is Jesus' first public miracle. Um, the background is simple enough. Uh, we've all been to at least one in our life, I would say, and this is a wedding. Um, what you will notice immediately um, within the scripture that we read, that there is a lack of the teaching um, that typically surrounded Jesus' miracles. Um, as we shared a little while back, and when we talked about the um, feeding of the 5,000, um, there was a greater meaning behind that miracle than just feeding some folks. And Jesus took the opportunity to share what that greater revelation was uh, the day after. And um, we don't see that in this instance. Um, we see Jesus work the miracle and that's it. Um, we cannot say that he did not teach or preach because the scriptures, like I said, are not a history book. It's not even a diary. Things were selected based off of the Holy Spirit's desire to get us to see the full picture of Jesus Christ. But by no means is it a biography of Jesus Christ. Okay, we can only say that we don't know. Um, we cannot say or speculate that he did do any teaching. Um, here is the simple sequence of events as it is told by John. Let's move forward. All right, the wedding takes place at some point. The Bible doesn't tell us whether the wedding had already started at some time earlier, or if this was the first day of the wedding. We don't know that that information is not given to us. 
But we do know that the wedding at least had started and Jesus and his disciples were invited when they get there. Amen. Um, we see that the guests were celebrating with food and wine. Mary, the mother of Jesus, recognizes that the host has run out of wine. And as we shared, this is a big deal in this type of culture. Um, it is a huge embarrassment not to be able to take care of your guests. This part of the world believes strongly in hospitality. So much and so that if somebody is under their roof, um, they feel it is their business to protect that individual, even with the lives of everybody in their household. Um, you'll see evidence of that when you look at the account of Lot. Amen. Glory to God. Um, way back um, then. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But Mary speaks to Jesus about the problem. And you'll see when you look at the text that Jesus does not give a, her a straight answer on this. Amen. Mary, however, isn't shaken by Jesus's response, but she simply turns to the servants and tells the servants to do what he tells you to do. Now, I want to pause here because it's obvious by looking at her reaction to the host running out of wine that she had some major part to play within this wedding. She was involved um, in the wedding um, in, in more than a casual way. She wasn't just a guest. Um, so Jesus ends up instructing the servants to fill the pots with water. These were heavy pots, I assume. They were stone pots that held anywhere from 22 to 33 gallons of water. And commentators believe that these water pots were actually used for people to wash their hands um, before they ate. And the significance of this is that this water was not drinkable water. This water was that which was only good enough to wash their hands with, amen, glory to God. But Jesus instructs them to fill the water pots. Um, so the Bible says they fill the water pots to the brim. Um, they did not hesitate to do what Jesus told them to do. And this is significant, and we'll, and we'll talk about this in a, a minute. This is significant um, that the servants obeyed Jesus. And they gave the wine to the governor, who is just the steward of the wedding, and he drank it and was amazed so much and so that he notices how good this wine is compared to that which was first served and says to the groom um, that this is some great wine. You know, usually they bring out the top shelf stuff at first. And after the people have drunk that, they bring out the worst. Amen. But in this case, you've saved the best for last. Amen. And then it is the end of the story. And the Bible simply says that this is the first of the miracles which Jesus wrought. It started here in Cana of Galilee. So let us dig into some significant facts about this event. First, we must continue, and I want you to think about this every time you think about this miracle or anything else that happened in the Gospels. We must think about it from the Middle Eastern perspective. This was a Middle Eastern wedding. Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. The Bible doesn't tell us whether they knew the bride and the groom, but we could safely conclude that there is a chance they did. All of these disciples and Jesus himself were from the geographical area of the Sea of Galilee. And so Nazareth and Cana are about 16 miles apart, and the other towns probably aren't much further in proximity. So there is a good chance that the bride and the groom and the guests knew who Jesus was and 
possibly knew the disciples. It is also speculated that Mary was so heavily involved in the wedding because this could have been a family member or a friend. But that is just commentary, and those are things to think about. So let me move quickly. Um, there seems to be that Jesus' mother Mary had a direct involvement in the wedding, which we already stated. Um, we, don't, we do not know why the host ran out of wine. However, it is a cultural insult and an embarrassment to the host to run out of food or wine when somebody has been invited as a guest to your home or to a wedding or anything that you're doing. This is why Mary was so adamant about the wine being gone. All right. Also note this, that Jesus was hesitant about doing anything. Jesus never touched anything involved in the miracle. I want to repeat this for emphasis. Jesus never touched anything involved with the miracle. He didn't touch the water. He didn't touch the stone pots. He didn't speak anything about the miracle. Neither did his disciples. But the servants, he did. He spoke to the servants and the servants obeyed his commands. There is something about obedience that will work a miracle in your life and in the life of those who you are around and who you are serving. These individuals were servants. Their job was to provide for the guests. That was their job. That was their one job, was to provide. And we can take a lesson from this because too many times we have to examine what the Lord is telling us to do instead of simply serving in obedience. This could not have made sense to them. Jesus is telling them to take some, take some water and not just put them in some regular pots, but basically put this in, uh, this water is being used for people to wash their hands in. Amen. Fill these to the brim and serve this water to the guests. I don't know how they felt about it, but irregardless of how they felt about it, they obeyed Jesus. And that's what we can take a lesson from is that we, if we have a mind to simply obey the Lord, you can't help but get the results that he desires. Amen. And oftentimes you will get the results that you desire because you are functioning from a servant standpoint and you have a servant perspective in that you are there to bless somebody else. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen. There would be a second. Uh, I think we're almost through. Bear with me a second. Something is happening to me. Okay. All right. John does not show any teaching that Jesus, um, any teaching from Jesus in this account. He's simply there. He works this miracle. Not many see him do it. The servant saw it. Mary knows because she's the one that asked him to do something and the disciples who were with him. Nobody else knows that he did this. There was no fanfare. Um, there was no, ah, Jesus is here and he worked a miracle. This was water and now it's wine. The guests had no idea where this came from. The steward of the feast had no idea where 
this um, wine came from. And uh, the groom had no idea where this wine came from. And it is fitting that oftentimes when the Lord works a miracle, the miracle is unseen. It amazes me how often the Lord works in this world. When I look at the things that God does without any notoriety, without pronouncing himself that he's doing it, it amazes me. I think about when we are on the road, on the highway, and literally there is a two inch line between you and another vehicle. And oftentimes people do not drive concentrating on the road, they are distracted. Um, sometimes people are tired from work. Um, you have all of these high speed machines going 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, sometimes headed toward each other. And there are minimal accidents. You can't tell me God isn't working miracles every day. Yes, it's good that prayer produces miracles, but God is working all the time. Jesus always said it in his earthly ministry. The work that I do, I see my father do. Amen. Glory to God. So let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. As previously stated, John does not record any teaching drawn from the event. Um, however, um, we can see that this miracle was a sign of Jesus' ability to provide. It is also clear that the miracle concerning um, this wine um, has theological and illustrative significance. Um, so what truth can we draw on this miracle and how can we expand upon it? Um, there are two clear truths drawn from this miracle and there are more. Um, one is part of the miracle included obedience of the servants to Jesus commands. Uh, I'll recap, they were told to fill the ceremonial washing pots with water and serve this water to the guests. This was unconventional. This was against the grain. This was countercultural um, to serve hand washing water to the governor of the feast. And I'm I'm the stu uh, I'm the servant. Um, that would be like working in a hotel as a, a I don't know a bartender. And somebody tells me uh, we run out of alcohol, so somebody tells me to go to the sink and get some water and put it into the bottles and then give it to um, the manager of the hotel to drink. Um, I'm sure this probably struck some fear in these servants, um, but they obeyed the word of the Lord, amen, and the miracle came to pass. Um, Jesus never told them that the water was turned into wine. Um, they just simply obeyed the commandment of the Lord. And they realistically probably only found out after they started serving. And that's a whole lesson within itself. Amen. Sometimes we look for the evidence to come before we do what God tells us to do. But in there are cases where we don't see the evidence until we start working. Amen. This is a sign miracle signifying the life and the new birth. Um, most believers identify the new wine as being um, the new life that is in Christ, being born again. So this miracle, in this miracle, Jesus symbolically brought life through the new wine, symbolizing the new birth. This was water. This was water in pots. And without speaking, without touching, he changed water into wine. He changed the molecular structure of an element or a compound, a hydrogen and oxygen. He turned that into wine that usually goes through a fermentation process. Um, that this miracle literally went against the course of nature and he never even spoke to the water or touch the water, amen. It came through the obedience of the servants that this miracle was wrought. And 
I admit he could have brought it without them doing anything, but this is how he chose to go about working this miracle. And sometimes you are going to be part of the process. You are going to be tied into the miracles of the Lord. And this excites me because oftentimes we feel like we are left out. We feel like we don't have any part to play. Amen. But God will work a miracle through your obedience. So it behooves us, amen, to have a spirit of obedience so that when the Lord wants to use us and just wants us to be part of the miracle process, we are fit to do it. And we have a servant's spirit so that when God instructs us and he speaks to us, um, we are ready to obey, amen, at his beckoning and at his call. Um, G John especially emphasizes this connection between wine and life, amen. And as a reference here, as Jesus also did so, he said, how can you put new wine into old bottles? This wine that he was talking about was the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And so this miracle, even though it doesn't seem like it really would matter, um, all that he really did was gave the people at the wedding some wine. Um, then they probably went home and went about doing what they normally would do. Um, but it touched a few lives. And this is something that John wanted to record so that those who wanted to know Jesus would understand that he is able to do what no other could do. Let's wrap up and close out. So the miracle at Cana was Jesus' first public miracle. Um, the nature of the miracle is impressive, but it's significant, doesn't seem very important. Okay, um, there were limited people who even knew the miracle was being performed or by who. Um, there appears to be no importance of the miracle as it pertains to the ministry of the prophesied Messiah because this was not a ministry that was public in a sense. It wasn't like the feeding of the 5,000. It wasn't like raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, this miracle only had very local and very temporary implications. Um, but when we look at the miracle, it is amazing uh, because of the fact that he really did nothing outside of telling the servants what to do. Now we know God being God that yes, he made it happen. But as far as the normal course of miracles and how Jesus usually did it, he wasn't directly involved from a physical standpoint, okay? But upon closer examination, we see the application of this miracle in two senses. First, obedience can bring fruition of miracles. And second, um, the miracle signifies the fluidity and the undiminishing nature of the Holy Spirit as the new one. Okay, we are concluding the, this episode. I'm dealing with the miracles of Jesus, um, him turning water into wine in Cana. Uh, we will discuss and break down each miracle. Um, this was miracle three of 15. Next week, we will explore the account of Jesus' provision of the tribute by the fish appearing with a gold coin in its mouth. Um, please prepare for that study. Didn't put the scripture down, but prepare for that study. We are going to talk about the fish that came um, with the gold piece to be able to pay the taxes for Jesus and his disciples. Um, thank you for watching this video. Um, share us, uh, or please give us a review on Google, Facebook, or YouTube. Um, please share it um, with those who you are connected to on the social media platforms. We'll also have this available um, for Rewind. This again is Saturday School at the Bible Institute. Um, consider supporting us like to support us, go to the website or go to the Facebook page and see how you can support us.
God bless you. Um, our endeavor, our mission at the Bible Institute is to provide biblical education for everyday people. Um, we have classes that run two semesters out of the year, and we also have some summer school classes. They are very affordable. And they are targeted toward the laity of the church and people who just want to um, you know, grow in their education as a Bible scholar, as a Bible student. Amen. So if that is you, um, please reach out to us and we are happy to serve you. Um, so God bless you and until the next time, shalom.